Welcome to Green Gotham. I'm Lou Blaustein. Lack of access to healthy, organic, farm-to-table food for low-income and at-risk populations in New York City and beyond is a big problem. Well, Chef Harold Villarosa, our guest, CEO of the Insurgo Project, is taking that problem on. Chef Harold, great to have you on Green Gotham. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, where does the name Insurgo Project come from? Uh, Insurgo comes from uh, a Latin verb called, it, it means going against the grain, rebelling and revolting. So the basis, the foundation of Insurgo is rebelling and revolting, and the vision is going against the grain. So being an insurgent in, in, in a sure. manner of speaking. So you're going against the grain by bringing healthy farm-to-table foods to people who don't have access to it to them and especially to kids especially to people that live in Washington Heights in the South Bronx well back a few months ago we had the great pleasure of taking a bunch of sixth and seventh graders from right. the Jonas Bronx Academy in the Bronx yep. to the Chelsea Market and the Food Network to I mean that really shook things up talk about in Sergo right. that shook their lives up yeah. Tell us a little bit about how that happened and what it was like for the kids. Well, we've been working with Jonas LeBron Academy for about a year now, and we decided to kind of give them uh, an experience that they have never received before. So I worked in the Food Network maybe 2010, and we kind of just came in there and asked them to see if we can bring the kids in. And they agreed, and we took the children to Chelsea Market, which is one of the best markets in New York City. And one of the claims that students said was, Oh, this market smells clean, even we were in the fish market. So they were very excited about meeting the butchers that were butchering the fish there. And also they were excited to meet all the chefs that were at the show. And you know what else was really cool? I saw it in their eyes when mm -hmm. we went to the produce store and right. they saw this organic, right. beautiful food, you right. know, peppers, tomatoes, and fruits right. that their eyes were like, yeah, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Well, you know, they set it up nice too, but <laughs> at the same time, you know, those products come from farmers that are an hour and a half away from the city, so they're very local. And then when we went up to the Food Network, what was it like for them to see the stars that they watch on television? Like well, I think the it was a realization Chopped, that they can accomplish anything in their lives as long as they work hard and on it. And that's how we explained it to them. You know, this this part of of the food media is is easily attainable if you just keep working hard and making sure that you follow the path that you want to do in the future. Now, the Food Network, you worked for them. Mm -hmm. what, was your, what was your role with, with Food Network? I was an intern. I was part of an internship program uh, from a uh, culinary school that was uh, basically people that came out of jail and kind of uh, what were doing food, were um, using food stamps, et cetera, et cetera. And so I got an opportunity to intern for the Food Network because they do those kind of programs for culinary schools. And they gave me a chance and I got in. And that must have been a huge opportunity that took your career from point A to another level. Well, they have the biggest library of food I have ever seen in my life. I, on my lunch breaks, I used to sleep in the library and just look at cookbooks and kind of explore the country and explore the world. And that's how I got to find out about other chefs in all over the country and kind of meet those chefs that were at the Food Network also and speak about it. Well, speaking of around the world, right. you're actually, you're, you're a global traveler right. and your uh, kind of your food vocabulary is, right. is global. You, you were born in the Philippines. Uh, you were there until you were how old? Nine years old. So in that time period, did you develop a love of Philippine food and food in general. What was it like there? No, and no, I didn't. You were a kid. <laughs> I was a kid. You know, I didn't really care about anything like that. You know, uh, cutting down a mango tree or, or riding a, uh, a buffalo to graze the land to put down the seeds was like daily living for me. 
but it was a shock coming to New York and not being able to do any of those stuff and not being able to see the products for myself, which was kind of uh, a time for my mom to tell me to assimilate into American living to be able to be prosperous in this country. When you say not being able to see the pro products for yourself, the products that you were used to back home? Oh yeah, for sure. You know, we used to have products that have dirt in them and, and kind of we have to clean them ourselves and like stuff falls from the tree, like we have to pick it up, stuff like that. But here in America, they're so pristine, you know, they're, they, they look so beautiful, they're so clean and they're so full. You know, in my country there's, you know, you only have five of these and you know, six of those. But, yeah. So then, so then you're going into your teen years and your high school right. years, and is when did the love of food and your 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 interest in becoming a cook or a chef come to pass? Well, it didn't really happen when I was in, in high school. It was more of a kind of survival instinct. You know, I didn't have any I didn't have any ways to make money. I wasn't really book smart or anything like that. So summer youth didn't really give good jobs, so I went to McDonald's and said, can I get a job? And that's when I started working at McDonald's on 34th and 8th Avenue, and then I, I know that McDonald's. <laughs> so I jumped from 34th and 8th Avenue, I went to White Castle, I worked at the Starbucks. Oh man, you hit all the great places. Yeah, Church's Chicken, and then um, I got an opportunity to move to the West Coast. Uh, my friend told me to come move because he didn't want me to be a statistic anymore in the, in the community. So I took a one-way plane ticket and moved to Provo, Utah, and I lived there for six years. And there I kind of really... Brigham Young territory. Brigham Young University. BYU. BYU, that's Go right. Go Cougars. <laughs> that's right. And so we, um, you know, I got a chance to really meet a lot more people that are not in the minority realm, you know. There's a lot more white people there. So we got you, a chance... You, you might say. <laughs> so we got a chance to really explore the West Coast. You know, I got to travel to Southern California, um, Mexico, uh, Northern California, et cetera, et cetera. So I got to see all that. But how did you get from... You know, working in McDonald's and White Castle to yeah. working at the best restaurants in the world. Well, it was in 2008. I I was watching Obama be, becoming a president, and from my understanding of his speech that he said in Chicago, he was basically telling me, you know, you can if I can do it, you can do it too. So that night, I bought a plane ticket back home, and I decided to enroll myself in culinary school. I couldn't afford those 40,000 ones, so I, I looked for the ones that were like $4,000, and I got into that one. And then um, I just decided if Bobby Flake could really make money out of it, then I've been doing this all my life, so I might as well just took care of it, and, and I just dove right into the passion of cooking. And did you ever did you ever write Obama and tell him this story? Because if not, you should. No, I never. No, I never. It was. Uh, I, That's an amazing story, right? Yeah, there. it was. Uh, you know, it's part of the journey, right? It's it's part of the whole the whole thing. And then after I got out of culinary school, I went to the Food Network. Then I got to understand who the chefs are in New York City. And then I went to approach a chef named Tom Valenti in, in a restaurant called West on the Upper West Side, which closed. Yes, expense. I know that place. Yeah. So you know, he does really straightforward American and Italian with French techniques. And I worked for him for only three months, and he fired me because I couldn't keep up. And it was like 250 covers, steak station, you know, the, the, the meat station. And so eventually he told me, come back to me when you're ready. So I went on a little journey. I, I staged at Oreo restaurant in the Midtown. I staged at Rouge Tomat. And I staged at a restaurant called Aquavit. And Which is a, a, also one of the top restaurants in the city. So yeah. you've been at, you quickly went from the low rung to the to the high rung. Well, you know, uh, cooks speak to each other. We have conversations about restaurants. You know, that's all we do all day. So I, I I retain knowledge from these other cooks about these other restaurants, and they wouldn't accept me because of my pedigree or where I worked at. So I just kept coming back every week and kept asking the chef to come into the kitchen until he said yes. And and so where did all during this kind of moving up the ladder? Mm -hmm. Where did your impetus to give back to the community and particularly in the realm of healthy eating come from? Well, we got, when, it, when I had an opportunity to go and, and stage at a restaurant called Noma in Copenhagen under a chef named Rene Rizepi. And when you say stage, just explain that. Oh, stage is a French term for an apprentice, which is working for somebody for free uh, with a common knowledge that um, you are receiving education through this process and no monetary gains at all, and this is just straight education. So I got a chance to stage in Noma in Copenhagen in 2010, 
and Chef Rene really speaks about um, community, speaks about micro-localization with food, and also speaks a lot about um, using products that are around you instead of wasting it and, and ordering from other places. So local, buy local. Buy local all the time and, and help the local art artisans really get in, gain some favor in the restaurant industry. So when I, when I was leaving, Chef Rene sat down and spoke to me for two hours about what I should do with my career and he really explained to me that you know, I shouldn't be one of these chefs that's reaching for the stars, you know. I should be the guy that's coming back to my community, giving back and giving this knowledge back to the community. So ever since then I've been checking off the list for what we spoke about and I've been following what he's been telling me to do. So when you came back, uh -huh. and even before probably, right. what did you notice was the food landscape for your community? If the community, let's say, in Washington Heights. Right. Well, you know, the, some of the products were old, and they looked beautiful on the outside, but when you cut into them, they were rotten, you know? So some of the products we're, we're getting from uh, GMOs or um, farmers that weren't doing any kind of social or kind of uh, ethical way of grazing these products. So, um, and the thing that really woke my, uh, my mind up to it was um, when I went to go and see uh, a friend of mine at his school, and I saw that the lunches at the schools were terrible. And you know, he said that the, the only uh, kids are only allotted a dollar twenty-five dollar and twenty-five cents a day per meal for the for the for the lunch period. So the Department of Education really hinders the the process. So you notice this, mm -hmm. and is this when Insurgo started to kind of percolate in your mind and yeah. to try and do something about it. And yes. so where did that come from and, and, and what became the business model? Because it's a for-profit company. Right. This is not a charitable uh, operation. So <coughs> maybe you can tell us how you got from the point A to point B. Well, we, we were thinking about, with my business partners, uh, of creating a nonprofit in the beginning because we felt the nonprofits would give us more um, accolades and kind of more, uh, we'll get well known in the community and we'll get more money in donations, et cetera, et cetera. But when we started talking to these nonprofits, they were stifled too. I'm talking about people were doing nonprofit work for schools for 10 years and still being step A, then super being step C already, you know, so. Doing nonprofit nutrition work. Nutritional work, farm to table curriculums for students in schools. We met a, a company that's been working on nonprofit. And define farm to table for, for our, our oh, audience as well. Farm to table is using products that are uh, 200 to 400 miles outside of the city. and So local. Local and also um, knowing where the product comes from, knowing how the product is raised, what the soil content is, and how the farmers uh, treat the animals that you use for the, for the food. So that's uber green. Yes, sir. So, so there were there were nonprofits that were trying to work with the school right. system with the, the board of education. And they were stifled the whole time. Stifled by the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy of the department and the red tape of the department of education. So you saw the route as going for profit. For profit. Uh, either way, we decided to uh, attach ourselves to the administration and, and talk to them personally on a level where they understood. It, administration of a particular school. Of a particular school. Particular school. So Not going to central no, board no, of it. No, no, no. We're talking about principals. We're talking about uh, teachers, et cetera, et cetera. And what were you selling them? What is the insert? project farm to table well, the pitch was we're gonna give something different for the students that they can attain in classrooms um, we're gonna give them uh, nutritional facts we're gonna give them uh, different types of classes where a beekeeper comes in and talks about his his career uh, a chef comes in and talks about her career uh, a chef from three Michelin stars comes in and talks about how he got to this point and what a green career looks like and how you can really attain a tangible career and life experience with green careers without uh, spending 80K on an education in college. And so this was the pitch. Right. And what was the first school that you and your partners went to? Uh, Jonas Brunk Academy in the, in the Fordham section of the Bronx. The ones we met. That's right. Yeah. So the teachers and, and everybody was already bought into the program. And they already understood. Was it a quick sell? Like, did they get it right away oh, when right you away. sold to the right administration? Right they away. said yes, and yep. boom. That boom. is, as someone right who away. sells, that is <laughs> manna from heaven. Yeah, you know, it, it, we came with nothing but transparency and, and the truth. And, you know, uh, 
those those administrations. I think the administrators nowadays in this generation are pretty much more of that hippie-ish kind of um, vibe, I guess. You know, they're coming from Harvard, they come from Berkeley, California, they come from schools that really kind of teach that social progress and social justice and food justice also. So, so they're receptive. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So then you go in and, di and so was this a curriculum add-on yes. for them and in what department, like who, well, we who, just, who we do you floated. liaise with? We, we floated, we floated the whole time. It was the principal was taking care of the whole project and she oversee everything. But we moved from social studies to science to math. Like it was different classes, and we taught in all these different parameters. See, I think that's brilliant, yeah. and I also think that is a way that, let's say, the bigger issue of climate change right. can be talked about. Yes, to sir. me, climate change is there's a science application, mm -hmm. obviously, but right. you could use teach it in, through math. Right. Obviously, social studies. Obviously, political science, right. English you can infuse it into every subject area. And right. something like farm to table, organics, nutrition. It's a big deal. And also, by the way, you may end up working in this world. They told me about politics because we talked about politics all day. And we talked about uh, sexual harassment, you know, all this stuff that we you know that is very kitchen talk. You know, that was an everyday thing. So farm to table, we met all the farmers. We we know how the, the products are being raised. And especially in these small kitchens, you know, it's very, these hardcore cooks and hardcore chefs very fundamentally sound about making sure we use the right products and so we run in Sergo just like a kitchen and then we run these programs just like a kitchen. So how did the teachers react? Did, because sometimes teachers I know don't like to be told oh here's this new thing. Yeah. So but did but then on the other hand it could be fun. Right. So, so how did they react? Some teachers in the beginning were very against it because you know they have a curriculum that they signed up for, this is why they came to the school for, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the bottom line is there's a budget for you to get paid for this, so they're gonna do it anyways. You know, so they ended up doing it and then next thing you know they fell in love with it. Now they're going on trips with us to uh, Nomad Restaurant, EMP, um, uh, food network sometimes and you know stuff like that so they, they they just bought into it at the end of the day and then and how about the kids well the kids um, the kids loved it you know I think people in uniform and any age level at, as young as that they, they 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 gravitate to real fast you know and is it only that sixth and seventh grade like what we took yeah. to Food Network that's where your well, sweet spot is when the beginning was because we and when was the beginning uh, 2013 so uh, you're December. now finishing your second, you've yes, just right. finished your second year. Yeah, almost finished the second year, yeah. So we did some market research and we believe that sixth graders were the utmost, they were the most receptive to the programming and they were the ones that can really uh, take it in like a sponge and be able to kind of let their parents know about it also. How did they react to getting to be able to eat this incredibly healthy but also tasty food perhaps stuff that they perhaps food that they've never tasted before. for example we did a salad right one of their chefs came in and did a salad and he bought all organic products five miles around the school and he bought it in and he made a salad for the kids and one kid stood up and said I never had salad before in my life he's 12 years old never had a salad before he's overweight oh my goodness. everything and that's we were, like po poster child we for were just stood there and we were just like this is unbelievable we could not believe this is happening right now he in never had a salad 2013 no, 2014 never had a salad I said this is crazy so that's when Joaquin and my other business partners and I we just decided man we got to go full on on this we got to save this generation so one school at a time one school at a time so now let's pivot a little bit to the urban assembly school for green careers right. and and for our viewers who were with us in our first season, we had uh, the program coordinator from Urban Assembly as one of our early guests, Michelle Andre. Right. They're a, a school on the Upper West Side a High School that is moving, ki moving kids towards green careers, green right. building, and or outdoors uh, uh, agriculture, uh, sustainable agriculture. Well, that's how we met her through you. Uh, you introduced us to Michelle Andre, and then um, we did research on the school, and, and it's a former school named Brandeis. It was it's rated right now the third worst school in New York City, in high school wise. So we were very excited about this because you saw opportunity, opportunity, and also they had a garden, which was amazing, right on the corner, and which was uh, it was decimated. I'm talking about weeds everywhere. 
There were 83rd in Amsterdam. 83rd in Amsterdam. There was um, vials of of uh, vodka bottles, et cetera, et cetera, and, and this garden. Very scenic. Very scenic, for sure. <laughs> and so we decided to kind of uh, just attach ourselves to it and, and just do the work. So we took three months, and we built out the garden, and now we have this beautiful, you should see it now, man, it's luscious. You got kale in there, this cabbage, this Swiss chard. We're growing tomatoes, cucumbers, and the kids was part of the whole process. You know, they, we, you know, there was a lot of kickback in the beginning when we went to the school, and kind of explain who we were and you know it felt like uh, we were in Compton or something the kids were yelling they, they were very angry disrespectful and, disrespectful but the voice that they they really said the whole time was the, the teachers don't care about us and that kind of took us back because we were like wow this is this is why these students don't achieve anything because nobody's really bought in into trying to save them you know so we just took it upon ourselves to do it and so what do the kids do with the garden? What are the what what are the activities? What are the what are, what is the curriculum for them? Well, we're building a summer program now with the students after we did those three months where they tilled the soil, they planted the new plants. We had a landscape architect come in and kind of map out the whole garden, make it look beautiful with flowers and all this stuff. And then so now the students are going in there this summer to create um, kind of a metrics on how the garden is progressing throughout the summer. So we're gonna have soil samples, we're gonna have um, plant identifica identifications, we're gonna have field trips to possibly Blue Hill Stone Barns and talk to the agriculture. Where's that? That's upstate, and it's a restaurant upstate that has a farm that's owned by Dan Barber, who's a chef. Yes, I've heard of him. Yeah, so we're gonna come visit him and kind of talk to his people and see how they maintain their garden and kind of bring that knowledge back to the garden that we have in 84th Street. And are the kids getting more respectful and more into it as? Oh yeah, for sure, they bought into it. We did an event June 1st with the school, um, having the kids kind of uh, before it, three weeks before it, uh, prepare and uh, get training on how to work in a restaurant. And they got to see the products that were coming in, work with the products, cook with the products some, and then work in the restaurant for that dinner where they served and also uh, plated some of the food. So from that event... Was we, that with Jacob's Pickles? With Jacob's Pickles, yes. Which is a restaurant right around the corner from the school. Right. And Jacob is very, you know, very into sustainability and very into healthy eating and healthy cooking right. and also very supportive of the school. Well, he created a nonprofit called Jacob's Digs, which uh, kind of correlates with UAGC, helps fund it, um, put new lights into the school for the horticultural room, et cetera, et cetera. So he's been really helpful for the whole the whole process. And so we did this dinner, and the kids bought into it after the dinner. And after that, we just had lines of kids asking to work with us. So the summer program, we have 10 students that are interning to work in this uh, summer program. And then we're going to gauge and catalog all of the plants that we have in-house. Uh, we're going to do a little box where we're going to do a soil sample, um, find out how we can maintain the garden for the long run and see if we can do a, a year-long garden with a root cellar and the green and the, the green um, the green garden I forgot what it's called the, yeah it's that is awesome and yeah. I also bet that the teachers there would are also positive towards what Insurgo is doing yeah. because that's motivating the, their students yeah definitely and it just comes from the bottom up you know and it's uh, it's really it's really amazing good work do you have a vendor relationship with the department of education is that something you're looking for yeah, we're looking into being a vendor for the doe um we're also working with other nonprofits such as new york sunworks uh, which is uh, a nonprofit that builds rooftop gardens for schools they're they're into 19 schools now um, we also are partnering with people out of state, such as uh, the Filipino Food Kitchen, where we're going to try to bring this model that we have here and bring it to Chicago and see if it can build it there. Um, so for the future, we're, we're really just trying to push the envelope a little bit more, kind of build our way into the DOE system and kind of see if we, how many schools we can really... Because to, to really have an effect, you're going to have to scale up. Oh, yeah, for sure. And... You know, do you have metrics for that? Do you that you're saying, okay, I want to be in 20 schools by I'm making it up 2017 in, right. in New York, and I want to be in six markets by 2020, and 
Well, yeah, you know, in the first year, we taught about 500 students in five different schools. And then uh, we're going to be doing classes in Fieldston Middle School, which is one of the prominent middle schools in, uh, in Riverdale, New York. Sure. So we're going to go from five to six, and maybe next year we'll go to ten. We don't want to take it slowly because our programming is very... It just it just adapts to the classroom and it's adapts, customized. It's customized for sure. So, you know, we have to have people that are buying in to come in and teach these kids. You know, I have to ask my chefs, friends for favors, and then you know uh, the scientists that we know let them come in and teach these kids. So, it's 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 burdensome, but at the same time, it's it's the best part of it. You know. And we only have a couple minutes left. The yeah. time has flown by. What is your vision for getting adults access to farm to table? and organic and healthy eating. Well, the end game for Encergo is really creating a building in Washington Heights where we, uh, on the top floor, and this is a vision, right? On the top floor is a culinary school which teaches, it's a nonprofit that teaches for um, people in the community, uh, students that want to learn about culinary arts. And the bottom level is a restaurant that serves 60 seats, and the back is a garden, and the rooftop is a garden. So what we're trying to do is kind of create a place where it's a holistic view on farm to table and how a, a, a whole building can really feed itself the whole time. So that's kind of the future goal for me. We move it to, to, to uh, location to location and especially low income and high need places all over the country and all over the world. Now how have you talked to the po politicians in these districts and how have they reacted? Well the conversation has not been really there yet with them. We want to still work with the schools and build those up and kind of build their name through that. But we have some people that we spoke to, like Helen Rosenthal and Gail Brewer. City Council and, and on the west side. That's right. And so, you know, some, some of the stuff is in, in motion, but essentially we just want to take our time with it and make sure that we do it right before really scaling up to the level. But that, that's the end game for us. Well, the, uh, my next question is, when can I come to your next tasting? Because this sound, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> well, we're going to do another dinner maybe in Riverside Park in September um, with our, one of our nonprofit partners. And hopefully we'll, you know, we'll, get, we'll, let, we'll definitely let you know about that. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing how you're helping to get kids and adults from a food desert to a food oasis. Mm -hmm. It's really great work that you're doing. It's inspiring. And thank you for watching. Join us again next time on Green Gotham.